Hello everyone, today we'll be looking at nasopharyngeal cancer. So let's look a little bit on the epidemiology, epidemiology first. Uh, so nasopharyngeal cancer is endemic in South China and it has intermediate risk in Southeast Asia, Middle East, North Africa and Arctic. So you can remember this by thinking from South to North. So Southeast Asia, South, Middle East, Middle, North Africa, North, and then Arctic is the more northmost part of the Earth. So South, then Middle, then North, then Arctic. That's how you can remember it. Um, it's more common in men, and the peak incidence is at ages uh, 50 to 59. So um, it starts around, um, it's usually diagnosed around this age. Risk factors include genetic predisposition, so if you are of South China descent or if you are uh, of Southeast Asian, Middle East, North African or Arctic descent. Um, Epstein-Barr virus exposure, so um, uh, one of the risk factors because of this is also low social economic background. Uh, this is because when you have uh, low socioeconomic background, you usually live in crowded crowded environments and Epstein-Barr virus is spread by saliva and so you are more prone to it. Um, also, uh, both genetic predisposition and Epstein-Barr virus exposure uh, contributes to a family history of nasopharyngeal cancer because um, if you are a family, you share the same gene pool and also um, you share food so uh, your cooking utens, uh, your chopsticks, your spoon and fork uh, might spread the Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, next is uh, preserved food. So um, food such as salted fish are risk factors for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And then also smoking and alcohol. Uh, smoking and alcohol is... Uh, um, more more associate uh, risk factor for American areas, uh, so and and smoking is also um, found to reactivate the Epstein Barr virus. Right, the Epstein Barr virus is a causative organism, so it's part of the pathophysiology of um, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Right, uh, let's look at the WHO classification. Uh, I don't know, I'm not going to talk about uh, the details about the difference between the different types, um, but uh, all you need to know is, all I want to say is that the type 3 is the one that's endemic. So the one that's in Southeast Asia, South China, Middle East, North Africa, and the Arctic. These are uh, the type 3 uh, nasopharyngeal carcinomas and these are the ones that are um, very highly associated with Epstein-Barr virus exposure because the Epstein-Barr virus uh, RNA is found in 95.1% of those with type 3 nasopharyngeal cancer and also it's a, it has better prognosis so better outcomes uh, compared to type 1 and type 2 nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Right. So, uh, what is the origin of nasopharyngeal carcinoma? Um, obviously, from the name nasopharyngeal cancer, it comes from the nasopharynx. So, where's the nasopharynx? Is it in the pharynx? It is the pharynx uh, behind your nose. So, this is your nasal cavity and this is your nasopharynx. So down here is the oropharynx, and the nasopharynx and oropharynx is uh, sep separated by the landmark, which is uh, your soft and hard palate over here. So this separates your uh, nasopharynx from your oropharynx. So nasopharyngeal cancer starts from the nasopharynx, and specifically it starts from the fossa of Rosamuller, which is around here, this area here. It's just posterior and superior to your um, eustachian tube opening. So this is your fossa of Rosamuller, 
where the nasal pharyngeal cancer starts. And um, from the CT scan, this is a coronal view, cross-sectional view, um, coronal view. So you can see from the red arrows over here where the fossa of Rosenmuller can, can be seen in the coronal view. Right? And um, this is a scan showing the presence of a nasopharyngeal uh, cancer. So the rosa, uh, fossa of Rosenmuller will disappear because there's a growth there. So the fossa goes away. Right. So let's look at a little bit on the pathology of uh, pathophysiology of uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, as we've mentioned just now, it starts from the fossa of Rosenmuller in the nasopharynx. And then the mass here, the tumor, can grow superior, anterior, or inferior. So if it grows superiorly, uh, these are the structures superiorly. This is the sph sphenoid sinus. Uh, and just lateral to the sphenoid sinus is the cavernous sinus, where lots of nerves actually pass through this area. Uh, the nerves that actually pass through this area involve cranial nerves 3, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, I've, met, I've made another video about uh, cranial nerve syndrome. Uh, uh, cavernous, sorry, cavernous sinus syndrome and also the cavernous sinus. So you can go and look at that and see what structures will be affected. So basic, uh, just uh, in summary, if it spreads superior, uh, it will affect the, it will invade into the cavernous sinus and affect any structures that are inside, uh, which are cranial nerves uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6 are uh, innovating your extraocular muscles, extraocular muscles, so muscles that control the movement of your eyes. So if these nerves are affected, um, you will have uh, double vision, or uh, this is because of the ophthalmoplegia. So uh, when you look at certain directions or when you look in front, one of your eyes will be deviated, so um, you will see double vision, right? And also the third nerve has two other functions. It supplies the liveta palpebrae superioris, which, uh, which, is in, uh, which is responsible for opening your eyelids. So if this third nerve is affected, you will have ptosis. And in this case, it's complete ptosis instead of partial ptosis, like myasthenia gravis. So in this case, it's complete ptosis. And also the third nerve... Uh, the other function of the third nerve is actually the pupillary constrictors. So if it's affected, you have dilated pupils. Uh, yeah, you can uh, observe for this by um, looking for pupillary reflex and you'll see one of the pupils are dilated because of the third nerve involvement. Right. Fourth and sixth nerve I have mentioned just now are extra ocular, uh, extra ocular muscles, and then the fifth nerve, uh, specifically fifth nerve, uh, first branch and second branch of the fifth nerve, so V one and V two. Um, so uh, you can test for fifth nerve involvement by doing a corneal reflex. Uh, yeah, so you use a cotton bud to touch on the sclera of their eye, and normally it will cause the patient to blink. As the corneal reflex, but in the patients where the fifth nerve has uh, less impairment to the fifth nerve, they'll lose this reflex. Okay, so that's if the tumor spreads superiorly and invades the cavernous sinus. You have symptoms of cavernous sinus syndrome, uh, such as complete ptosis. Uh, the dilated pupils, um, double vision, ophthalmoplegia, or also proptosis because the cavernous sinus has uh, uh, veins, veins that drain the superior and inferior op ophthalmic veins, right? And you can go and see the video on cavernous sinus syndrome, right? 
and the growth can also spread anteriorly so anterior it will be your nasal cavity here so if it spreads to your nasal cavity you have you invade the blood vessels in your nasal cavity it will cause epistaxis or nose bleed uh, it will cause nose block since it's blocking the area here and it will cause a nasal voice so you, uh, nasal voice is when you talk as if your nose is blocked so this is nasal voice right nasal voice and uh, it can also spread inferiorly so if it spreads inferiorly it will block the opening of the eustachian tube and what's the function of your eustachian tube is to drain the fluids and balance the air between your ears right so it, it goes to your inner ear it's responsible for draining fluid from your inner ear and so if this is blocked uh, fluid will accumulate and uh, your ear will become congested with fluid and you have hearing loss and this hearing loss is a conductive hearing loss instead of a sensory neural hearing loss uh, this is because the hearing loss is due to the uh, fluid accumulation and not due to the damage to the eighth nerve right and other than the growth of the tumor itself it can also spread to your lymph nodes and the first uh, lymph nodes that will that the cancer will go to is your cervical lymph nodes cervical means neck yeah and we'll be looking at that here so this is a categorization of the cervical lymph nodes by roman numbers so 1a and 1b is below your mandible uh, then 2, 3 and 4 is along your sternocleidomastoid and 5a and 5b is in your posterior triangle of the neck and 6 is in the anterior triangle of the neck and 7 is in the supraclavicular area so the supraclavicular area is the last um, station for any cancers of the head or neck, head and neck cancers so these uh, lymph nodes that will be involved um, for nasopharyngeal cancer particularly um, the cancer will spread to the lymph nodes in regions 2, 3 and 4 so along the sternocleidomastoid so first it will spread to 2, then 3, then 4 right um, this region of the lymph nodes is uh, important for when you want to plan for management of radiotherapy so uh, let's say you want to uh, radiotherapy is the treatment of nasopharyngeal carcinoma right? so you want to do radiotherapy you do a scan uh, and you see that uh, the cervical lymph nodes in area 2 are involved so you're not going to just do radiotherapy on area 2, you're going to do on area 2 plus 1. So, um, yeah, this is because uh, if you see the um, mass in the area 2, there might already be um, microscopic metastasis to uh, area 3, but you can't see it yet. So to be safe and prevent it from spreading further, you actually do radiotherapy on area 2 plus 1, which is areas 2 and 3. So same if you see the mass in uh, the tumor has spread to areas 2 and 3, you're going to do radiotherapy on areas 2, 3 and 4 because the tumor actually spreads uh, from 2 to 3 to 4. So anything you see, then plus 1. That's the one of the principles okay and lastly uh, other than leaf node spread it can also metastasize this is the most dangerous feature of a cancer which is spread to other areas metastasis and um, common areas of metastasis are the lungs and liver right uh, so let's look at the staging of nasopharyngeal carcinoma a little bit. This is uh, from Cancer Research UK and I've 
summarized it and make it more simple so it's easier to understand and remember. So stage zero or known as uh, carcinoma in C2, um, some doctors call it precancerous, um, is when the nasopharyngeal cancer is only on the surface of the nasopharynx. Right. And stage one is when the tumor has grown into the nasal cavity or to the oropharynx. So if you look at the diagram here, uh, this where it starts, it has spread into the nasal cavity or the oropharynx, which is behind the mouth. Right. Stage two is when there's local spread to the cervical lymph nodes, as I mentioned just now, uh, areas two or three or four. Uh, and the uh, cervical lymph nodes has to be less than 6 cm and it's only on one side. So stage 2 is uh, cervical lymph nodes on one side less than 6 cm. Stage 3 is either invasion to the bones or spread to both sides of the lymph nodes but still less than 6 cm. So invading the bone uh, means uh, it has invaded the, the uh, sinus areas because the bone actually separates our skull into several spaces and some of the spaces uh, such as the maxillary sinus, uh, your frontal sinus, these are sinuses in your bone so your, your tumor might have invaded into one of these sinuses or spread to both sides of the lymph nodes. That's stage 3. And then stage 4 is separated into stage 4a, 4b and 4c. So 4a and 4b is still not metastatic, so it's not, there's no metastasis yet. Um, and uh, 4a, uh, I like to call it a huge mess, because there's invasion of the cranial nerves or into the orbit or into the lower throat. So if you look at the diagram here, you can imagine that it has spread all the way up here into the cranial nerves or into the orbit, which is uh, lateral here, you can see it here or into the lower throat. So the tumor has grown really big in size. So 4A is huge tumor, huge mass. And 4B is huge lymph nodes because the lymph node is more than 6 centimeters. Just now stage 2 and 3, the lymph nodes are involved, but it's less than 6 centimeters. 4B is when the lymph node is bigger than 6 centimeters. And then 4C is when there's metastasis, for example, the lung. So uh, I'll go through the treatment options of uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So there's radiotherapy, there's concurrent chemo radiotherapy, and there's neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by radiotherapy. So neoadjuvant means you are giving chemotherapy first. Neo first. Neo. Okay. Right. So for radiotherapy is usually for stage one uh, nasopharyngeal cancer, and then if uh, it's stage two to stage four, it's uh usually it's concurrent chemo radiotherapy so chemotherapy and radiotherapy at the same time uh, but this is for non-metastatic so that's, that means uh, stage 2 to stage 4a and 4b right and then uh, in some cases you're gonna do chemotherapy first followed by radiotherapy uh, this is because um, if, if structures with low radiotherapy limit is nearby for example the pituitary gland or the optic nerve you're going to want to shrink the tumor size first before giving radiotherapy so that uh, the these structures can be avoided right so radiotherapy is basically um, giving radioactive waves to the, the mass right if the mass is too big uh, you need a bigger area so you might hit these structures so sometimes you give a uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy to shrink the tumor size first and then give radiotherapy so that you can avoid these structures. And yeah, surgery is rare unless uh, in recurrent nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It's rarely done because it's difficult to assess that area. Nasopharynx. Right. Speaking of the avoiding radiotherapy uh, exposure to this structures with low radiotherapy limit, right? Some of the structures that you cannot avoid are the parotid glands and the temporomandibular joints. 
So this will be affected when you give, uh, these are some of the side effects when you give a uh, radiotherapy for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. You have dry mouth because the parotid gland is involved and uh, you might have difficulty opening your jaw because the temporal mandibular joint is involved. So these are the side effects. And also, um, before doing the radiotherapy, the patient is always advised to do a dental clearance first. So if there is uh, any tooth that looks like it's decaying and requires removal, so you're going to remove it first before the radiotherapy. This is to prevent osteonecrosis. So because uh, radiotherapy will um, damage the small vessels that are supplying your bone area, uh, when you do a normal, when when your bone is uh, prior to radiotherapy, your bone can heal. Whenever you do a dental procedure, the old bone is replaced by new new bone efficiently because of the small vessels in your bone. And then, um, but after radiotherapy, these small vessels are affected. And hence, uh, the replacement of your old bone with new bone is affected as well. So if you do dental procedures after radiotherapy, your bones can't heal that well, can't replace the old bone that well, and osteonecrosis might occur. So to prevent osteonecrosis, always advise the patient to uh, do dental clearance first. Right. And that's all I have for you. Thank you.